By the way. What? A United Nations report came out mm -hmm. that I read today that said that in 2023, India is going to surpass China as the most populous country on earth. Do you know what that means? That means during lockdown, we know what you guys were doing. Indians are very good at that. <laughs> Hey, welcome back to our stupid directions against Corbin. How many of you have created people listening to us? I want to know, was that, were we your background music? We're good baby-making music. Yeah, we are. Sure. I got to tell you. Especially some of the reactions we do. You turn on a little uh, thing there and you get some rhythmic dancing or some Helen moving those hips. That'll motivate you to populate India. <laughs> Today we got a, uh, you know those little animated videos we, we've seen many times before. That we love so much? Yeah. Yeah, the instructional ones? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the time India's kingdom invaded Southeast Asia. Oh. Right this? Uh, Rajendra Chola and the Maritime Chola Empire. Chola Empire, I do believe, is what Money Rotnam's film is about. The the Chola. Uh, oh, I do, cause awesome. I, I got sent this a lot after the teaser. After the teaser. Um, and so... Uh, a lot of people sent us this to get a little more information about uh, that. You guys are dynasty. so freaking uh, great. And so, if there's other videos that we can also thank you. Um, and apparently, there's a that that whole um, thing that they're making is a is a book, one of the most famous books in Tamil. Um, oh, that they're they're turning into a film. That they're turn, they've tried for Mani Ratnam's tried for many times, like back in the day. Right. I remember you telling me this. Kamal Hassan right. was actually supposed to. I remember star in it, but the budget and all that. Yeah, kind of budget stuff. effects. Things of that nature, but um, yeah, I, I would just, we've said it over and over again. It's its one thing for people to be teachable, which Corbin and I, that's a value for us all of our lives is to remain teachable, which has helped us to embrace what we l have learned. But to have teachers mm -hmm. like you guys yeah. who are constantly wanting us to learn so that we just, we encounter something and then you have consistently over the years bombarded us in the most beautiful way with information to help broaden our understanding is a huge gift. So thank yes. you for doing that. Absolutely. Yeah. Indian history can be a bit tricky for the uninitiated. <laughs> yes, it can. <laughs> in an effort to build a cohesive story for a nation whose people have been stitched together into a sort of post-colonial Frankenstein, we're given only a thin slice of the whole. The Indus Valley Civilization, the Mauryas, the Guptas, the Mughals, the British Raj, and the Independence Movement. Simple, clean, and limited. And quite frankly, a bit stale. Here's the dirty little secret of Indian history. We rarely learn about its most interesting players, only its most convenient ones. Hmm. Well, that's about to change right now. Meet the Cholas, a visionary maritime empire from the deep south of India in a region known as Tamil country. The Cholas were many things, warlike, opportunistic, and politically manipulative. But above all, they were ambitious. By the medieval era, they had fashioned themselves into a regional hegemon that dominated their contemporaries in India and Southeast Asia, and established extensive intercontinental trade networks. Perhaps the single most impressive feat of the Cholas was their naval invasion of Southeast Asia in 1025 CE, part of a multi-generational effort to gain supremacy over international sea trade. A naval invasion in 1025. Invasion, and the century of pseudo-colonial intervention that followed, is one that challenges conventional perceptions of Indian Empire. I'm seeing the trailer in my head. But let's dig into some historical context first. The Chola dynasty first came into being sometime around 300 BCE in the Kaveri River Delta. Same as America. In the beginning, the Cholas <laughs> were reliant on the sea for wealth. Sorry, 200 years ago. Visited Sorry. by ships from lands as far away as China and Rome. In the early medieval era, the Cholas were nothing more than a mere vassal kingdom to the dominant Pallavas. That all changed, however, when the Pallavas found themselves embroiled in a series of conflicts in 850 CE. From their core city of Urayur, the Cholas exploited an opportunity to capture the city of Tanjavur from the Pallavas, thereby wresting control of the region from their former overlords. Over the next 150 years, the Cholas went through what might be considered a civilizational golden age. Tamil arts, culture, and language flourished. Government administration was centralized and approved. Using processed palm leaves as a sort of paper substitute, the Cholas kept copious records, from administrative reports to legal disputes to internal reviews of official misconduct. <laughs> Meanwhile, surveys and centralized revenue collection ensured fairness in taxation. 
The chill has also introduced elected councils whose officials were subject to regular auditing. These and other reforms undercut the role of local feudatories, thus consolidating Chola power and creating the infrastructure necessary to maintain a large, well-run empire. But it was this man, Rajendra Chola I, who would put them on the world stage. As crown prince, Rajendra led campaigns against neighboring rivals. Under the command of his father, Rajaraja Chola, he conquered the Western Ganga dynasty, the Cheras, and the Pandyas. Together, they extended the boundaries of the empire over much of South India and Sri Lanka, defeating their enemies and forging deep political and familial alliances with the Telugus of Vengi. Thus, by the time Rajendra Chola I ascended to the throne in 1014 CE, he had inherited an empire on the precipice of historical greatness. Freshly coronated and no doubt influenced by his father's expansionary policies, Rajendra began to shape into being a true cross-regional empire. Rajendra was a busy man. In less than a decade, he used his navy to blockade and subdue rebellious lords along the Malabar coast, carved out territories belonging to the Western Chalukyas, supported his nephew's succession claims in Telugu country, finished his father's conquest of Sri Lanka, occupied the Maldives, and established Chola dominance over the Andaman Islands, thus securing a oh, foreign wow. base into Southeast Asia. That's a long time. He way. also installed his sons as regional viceroys to further entrench central control over these dominions. But even after all of this, he was just getting started. In 1023 CE, Rajendra decided to raid northern India. He marched with his armies to the northeast, all the way up to the banks of the river Ganges. On the way, he defeated the forces of Kalinga, and, with the path cleared to Bengal, descended upon the Pala Kingdom and defeated them too. Rajendra was so pleased with himself that when he defeated the Pala Kingdom, he filled up large tanks with water from the river Ganges and transported them all the way back to the Chola heartland. To commemorate the victory, he constructed a formidable temple at the center of a new capital city, Gangaikonda Cholapuram, meaning conqueror of the Ganges, and blessed it with his pillaged holy water. But why all this warmongering? Why risk everything to subdue distant enemies? See, the Indian subcontinent lies at the center of an oceanic trade superhighway known as the Maritime Silk Road. The importance of the Maritime Silk Road cannot be overstated. For thousands of years, ancient powers moved significant cargo along these routes. Early writings in Tamil country describe streets packed to the brim with goods from around the world, while government records in Tang Dynasty China indicate that the quantity of goods entering through its license ports generated a large portion of the country's total tax revenues. Control over the Maritime Silk Road was invaluable. Military and administrative dominance gave major powers the ability to position their economic machinery, such as trade guilds, more favorably in the global markets. The Chola military offensives were part of a strategy to suppress rivals that might otherwise compromise their supremacy over the maritime Silk Road mm. trade. It's hardly a coincidence that nearly a half century of conflict led to Chola control over most of the prominent trade centers along India's coasts. We've mentioned trade guilds a few times, so what role did they play in all of this? For most of Tamil history, trade guilds were influential in both the economic and political spheres. By the medieval era, trade guilds had grown extremely powerful with some wielding greater de facto authority than local feudatories. Like SAG. There were many trade guilds, the 500 <laughs> lords of Ayabolu, the Anjavanam, and the Manigamam, among others. Each had their own specialty, history, and supply networks. An 11th century inscription describing the 500 said the following about the guild. Famed throughout the world, having 18 cities of the four points of the compass, born to be wanderers over many countries, by land routes and water routes penetrating into the regions of the six continents, with superior elephants, well-bred horses, large sapphires, moonstones, pearls, rubies, diamonds, cardamoms, cloves, sandal, camphor, musk, saffron, and other perfumes and drugs, selling wholesale or hawking about on their shoulders, preventing the loss of customs duties, filling up the emperor's treasury of gold and his armory of weapons. The guilds likely wielded significant behind the scenes influence. We know that the trade guilds would maintain their own flag standards, as well as their own private armies and fleets. We also know that some trade guilds lent money to kings, including Rajaraja Chola and Rajendra Chola. It was a risky proposition to go against the demands of the trade guilds. If Rajendra were to get on their bad side, he might find his rivals suddenly equipped and funded to stage a takeover. To put it bluntly, the trade guilds benefited from Chola dominance of the maritime Silk Road trade. Whether they actively pushed for war remains a mystery but it's fair to say, yeah, they probably did. 
Having secured their dominance over the Maritime Silk Road vis-a-vis -vis other Indian powers, one would think that the Cholas could finally sit back and enjoy their hard-earned rewards. But that was not the case. Srivijaya, a powerful thalassocracy based in the Malay archipelago, was actively interfering with trade and damaging Chola interests. See, by the turn of the 11th century, the Maritime Silk Road was undergoing some significant changes. The decline of the Abbasid Caliphate in Baghdad was matched by the rise of the Fatimid dynasty in Egypt. Ships leaving from the Fatimid territories would scoot past the Horn of Africa and toward Chola ports, where goods would be sold and retransported by Tamil crews headed towards Southeast Asia and China. Meanwhile, on the other side of Asia, the Song Dynasty ushered in an era of unprecedented economic prosperity. Everyone was lining up for an egg from the Song Dynasty Golden Goose, including, of course, the Fatimids. Thanks to the creation of powerful pro-trade dynasties on both ends of the Maritime Silk Road, the sea trade was booming in a way that it had not for several centuries. Normally, ships would stop at both South Indian and Southeast Asian ports, but advancements in shipbuilding technology meant that ships could travel farther, faster, and more safely than ever before, making two stops unnecessary. Soon, the central region of the Maritime Silk Road played host to an intense and underhanded competition between Srivijaya and the Cholas. For years, Srivijaya bribed Orang Laut, colloquially known as Sea Gypsies, to stop them from engaging in piracy and interfering with trade. The Sea Gypsies were Aboriginal communities who lived along the coastlines of Srivijaya territory. Like most pirates in history, they were frustrating and useful in equal measure. The Sea Gypsies received a portion of customs proceeds from Srivijaya, and in turn promised to do something less violent with their time. <laughs> Once the trade conflict with the Cholas heated up, however, Sri Vijay do something like that. Why, yeah. Why do you have to kill? To Just go fish. This time on their behalf. <laughs> okay. The Sea Gypsies began to Makes force sense. all passing ships to dock at Sri Vijay ports and pay customs, resupply, and more. As a result, Chola ports were being made redundant. There's also evidence that Tamil trade guilds were being actively suppressed in Southeast Asian ports due to Sri Vijay's influence. Oh. Interference with maritime silk road trade no doubt prompted Rajendra to attack the Srivijaya and normalize the situation. After all, he and his father had not spent decades warring and subduing their maritime rivals in India simply to have the fruits of their labor rot on the vine. Srivijaya would have to be punished. The Chola invasion involved three major Southeast Asian players. Srivijaya, of course, but also Thumbalinga, a Malay kingdom based out of what is now southern Thailand, and Angor, an ambitious peninsular kingdom based out of what is now Cambodia. In the early 11th century, the Cholas were a staunch ally of Angor, while Srivijaya was allied with Thumbalinga. It's possible that religion played a part in this diplomatic arrangement. Mm. Thumbalinga and Srivijaya were Usually Buddhist does. Kingdoms, while Angor and the Chola Empire were Hindu Shaivite. In the year 1025 CE, the kingdom of Angor was embroiled in a conflict with Thumbalinga, and requested military assistance from the Cholas. The Cholas agreed to help Angor, likely knowing what would happen next. When the Cholas formally declared war on Thumbalinga, yeah, they wanted Srivijaya it. came to the aid of its ally right. and declared war on the Cholas and Angor. With their inevitable conflict now made real, Rajendra Chola gathered his navy and prepped for the subsequent invasion. The Chola navy was on the leading edge of naval technology for their time. In years past, Rajendra's father had imported the talents of Chinese and Arab shipbuilders to work on research and development for the Chola Navy. With their help, the Cholas implemented critical naval technologies, including watertight hull innovations that allowed their fleet to traverse rougher seas, a mariner's compass, and further advancement of a flamethrower weapon not unlike the legendary Greek fire utilized by the Byzantine fleets. Wow. Oh, wow. <laughs> we got flamethrowers. When the war Take that, began, Elon Musk. Srivijaya was the main target. <laughs> Rajendra split his fire-breathing fleet into two groups, the main invasion fleet and an auxiliary force. The auxiliary force That's was just one boat. of the Straits of Malacca. I'm not going to do a lot with Srivijaya that. The fleet was waiting, positioned to take on what they assumed would be the bulk of the Chola fleet. Uh -huh. Little did Srivijaya know that the Chola main invasion fleet was sent south of Sumatra, positioned behind I, the island. I keep th thinking the island they're saying Boca Chola. The Chola fleet circled around the island and made their way to Palembang, the southern capital. When they arrived, they sieged and sacked the city. Afterwards, the combined Chola forces pincered the Srivijaya fleet in the straits, defeating them easily. Why would you stay there, idiots? 
Why was this decisive maneuver allowed to happen? They watched Braveheart. Well, Sri Vijaya did not anticipate that's a, that the that's a maneuver in Braveheart. Had been outfitted with technology that allowed them to traverse the rough waters south of Sumatra. It wasn't an unreasonable blind spot. Moving an entire fleet south of Sumatra right. during the monsoon season had never been done before and was seen as impossibly risky. After steamrolling the Sri Vijaya Navy, the Chola forces laid siege to Kadaram, the northern capital of Sri Vijaya, and captured this important administrative and trade center for themselves. For the Cholas, conquest seems to have been uncompromising. They plundered countless treasures and took the Sri Vijaya king, Maharaja Sangrama, as their prisoner. With Sri Vijaya effectively subdued, the Cholas finally moved a portion of their fleet to battle with Tumberlinga and helped to quickly bring that kingdom under Angor's control. The Southeast Asian invasion was an unequivocal success. In just a few months, the Cholas had defeated the mighty Sri Vijaya and ended a prosperous multi-century dynasty. That's so awesome. Oh. Though the invasion brought an end to the Sri Vijaya Sailendra dynasty, its impact was manifold. Gosh, Success dang. emboldened Chola ambitions in Southeast Asia. For the next hundred years, they became intimately involved in Southeast Asian politics. The Cholas formed new alliances, performed raids, and generally used their influence to bully the weaker players so as to create an economically favorable situation. Something of a pseudo-colonial approach. Sorry. I'll show to you entrench themselves further, the Cholas established permanent military garrisons in Sri Vijaya and Angkor territory. That's probably smart. To serve as remote forces for promoting their interests. And Starbucks. The soft influence in those of the same Cholas spot. increased too. Tamil trade guilds came to dominate in the major commercial centers of Southeast Asia and Southern China. And the Cholas sent regular political envoys to China, Angkor, Bagan, Pegu, Sri Vijaya, and other Asian oh, powers. I'll peg you. Establishing closer diplomatic relations. In the wake of the invasion, Chola elite intermarried with Southeast Asian royalty. Rajendra, for example, is believed to have taken Onan Q, the daughter of the captured Sri Vijaya king Sangrama, as his wife. Since that time, Malay royalty claimed and continue to claim Chola heritage, and their princes have been variously named Raja Chulan, an attempt to recall this unique past. But intermarriage was more than just a historical curiosity. Close family relations meant that the Chola could more legitimately prop up claims of royalty that would be friendly to their interests. In 1077 CE, for example, a succession dispute in Kadaram led to direct Chola intervention. Rajendra's grandson, Kulotunga, conquered Kadaram on behalf of a Chola descended claimant to the crown, putting him on the throne as a sort of puppet king. But familial connections would not always lead to loyal service to the crown. At the turn of the 12th century, Sri Lume Chola, a half Tamil, half Malay prince from Sumatra, was sent with the Chola expeditionary force to the Philippines to scout the country ahead of a potential invasion. Sensing an opportunity to make himself into a king, Sri Lume suddenly decided to defect from the Chola Empire and conquer the island of Cebu under his own banner, establishing the long-lived Rajanate of Cebu. Though the Cholas lay forgotten by the bulk of humanity, their legacy survives in the blood and culture of their descendants, in India and in Southeast Asia. For far too long, the world has lived in quiet ignorance of the great power that once emerged from across the sea. And now you know. That Very was great. informative. Very informative. Um, and, and yeah, I had never heard about that. Um, if I did in school, it was one of those classes I just didn't pay attention this to. This is what I want to say to the Cholos. Wow. <laughs> you... <laughs> Your brain is melting. Your did it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, I think it's actually it has to be different cuz the other the other one that we listened to even though it's similar animation, it's uh it's a, it's different, a different voice story. and different kind of yeah. they, a lot more comedy with the the other ones. Yeah, there was more there was comedy and this had no comedy, but that's and, fine. And I'm guessing that um Money it's, Rottenham's film is more a fictional story with them as the main characters. You guys tell me if I don't know specifically. And I would imagine, or, I mean, don't know the scope of it, but that's a lot of history to cover. My suspicion is that it would cover one giant naval or two, not well, multiple. This was uh, one, this is the first part. We don't know how many films. Of oh, this that's true. Making. They could do a lot of films. Well, we know they're at least doing two. Yeah, we could do a lot of films on that. Um, but 
yeah, it's uh, it's it's cool to have that information, and um, and also a lot of people said that um, if you've read the book of that what, PS One or whatever, P, whatever right the thing is, um, even though it looked like this giant epic and there there's some action, it's a lot more small story oriented than a RRR or right a, right or, or something like that. More like, true historic epic than giant blockbuster my guess feel. more like beginnings of game of thrones right style right in terms of um just god the people got so mad when i said game of thrones i'm not comparing it obviously i know y'all were around way before game of thrones i'm saying in terms of how they did it in terms of it was all story oriented right and right right oriented then good. there was some good action action that was action, added that that came much later in the series really absolutely when they could afford it yeah yeah because it cost a lot of money to do what they wanted but a lot of times like they often like there was a battle and they would just cut yes like Tyrion would get knocked out and there would have been an entire battle that had gone on and then you didn't see it yeah that's happens with them when the lannisters go to fight and he gets knocked down you don't see that fight no nope. because they didn't have the money to do it oh no uh, but yeah, and that's what makes that such a great show is because they focused on story and it's, I'm amazed every time we learn something historical because it's the same thing every time history, at least when we were growing up and I don't know if it's changed at all cause I can't imagine it has. We don't learn about this. You know what we learn about? We learn about history from the Western perspective. We learn about Alexander the Great and we learn about Ivan the Terrible and we learn about the expansion that happened through Greece and Rome and we might go back to Sparta and you know we we don't hear much Asian history when we talk about what's going on here because except Tom Cruise and Last Samurai that's true which is all 100% accurate and the most important story to come out of Asia gotta love white saviors did you see that movie no oh it's actually quite good that's what I hear but it's also um, isn't they whitewash it uh, I'd have to see it again it's, I haven't well, seen it Tom since Cruise it came out. Asian story. I feel like it's yeah, but has to be whitewashed. No, not at all. Because he he actually is. It's it's more like um, oh, what was that film with Dustin Hoffman? And then it also happened. Rain Man. No, no, Rain no. Man. It was early in Dustin Hoffman's career. Rain it Man. Was, it was Rain Man. Little Little Brig House. Little Prairie. No, Little Big Horn. Little Big Dick. That's it. Little Big Dick. No, he plays a, an American cowboy who gets captured by a Native American tribe and winds up. It's very um, uh, Dances with Wolves. It preceded Dances with Wolves by 25 years. But that's Last Samurai is that. He is a, a, a drunk, white, awful guy who ends up being brought in by this community and ends up wanting to fight for them. Without giving you too many spoilers, it's 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 one of my favorite among many. And there was actually Variety and Hollywood Reporter just did lists of the fifteen best Tom Cruise films since Maverick did so well. Last Samurai is in, always in the list of the top fifteen of Tom Cruise's best films. But it amazes me how little we know of Eastern history because in the West we're basically like, oh, doesn't matter to us. I don't get it. Why should it? It's, it's not it's a humanity. White story. We are human beings, not Western beings or Eastern beings. Your mom's it's, a being. It's all humanity. Anyways, if there's other videos that can edumacate us before the film comes out. Yes. I, I'm debating on actually because there's apparently an English translation audiobook of the books. Mm. That's supposed to be pretty good. No, I like, bet it is, but. People say it's good. But I'm also, do I want to read that and have everything, even though right. it's probably really good. Not being able to see it first on the screen. That's yeah. always my thing. I don't mind reading a book and then finding out it's going to be made into a movie. But when I find out a book is being made into a film, I typically don't read the book and want to see the film first. Because almost always the, the, the films don't live up to the book. Mm. Almost always. Yeah. One of the best adaptations, I think, is The Lord of the Rings films. Yeah. That, that's, that's one of the best have you book ever read the books? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. And that's why I say that. There's a lot more in the books. There's a lot more in the books, but it's it's one of the best, I think. Yeah. You can never cover ever. One page can give you what that's why a book can be 400 pages and a script is only 120. Yeah. So, anyways, uh, if there's other videos we can react to, please let us know what they are yeah. down below. Just